spring is in the room and a young man's fancy turns to Kansas City Chiefs football. Welcome back to the second annual Shaggy Shane Kansas City Chiefs free agent freak out frenzy. The dogs are barking, the rumors are spilling, people are talking because everybody's psyched about the Kansas City Chiefs free agency which begins officially four days from tonight. You know you're going to lose an hour of sleep. I'm going to lose an hour of sleep. The masses worldwide are going to lose an hour of sleep. But thank you for staying up late with us this evening. My guests with me tonight really no, need no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. To my left, you know him, you loved him, and if you loved him, you better get help. The KC Beardmaster, best known to the masses worldwide as Lance Twidwell of The Spoken. How the hell are you, my brother? I'm feeling really good, especially now that I'm sitting next to such high energy like this. Uh, talking football with this guy, let alone, is great, but when he comes with it like that, I mean, it's hard to <laughs> overcome that. So I'm just going to play alongside because this is a lot of fun already. Hell yeah, hell yeah. And the man to my right started a dream with me 14 months ago when we sat down and said, hey, let's put something together for Curse of the Kingdom, Rise of Mahomes. We started throwing pictures at each other, and this man took it to another level with his Red Tribe Cinema supremacy. The man you know and love, the king of all kings on social media and Twitter, Clay Windler. How's it going, Clay? I'm... I was having a rough day until I got here, and now uh, I'm like <laughs> frantic just because of you. So, hell yeah, we're all Chiefs fans. We were at the AFC Championship game uh, a month and a half ago. The Chiefs were in overtime, and they lost a heartbreaking, hard-fought game in overtime. Which uh, I did a post-game show. After, immediately after that game, and uh, I was pretty critical of Andy Reid. A lot of people saying, hey, Shaggy, you were critical of Andy Reid. I want to get to my point, and I want Lance and Clay to jump in on this criticism of Andy Reid of mine. I'm in the minority when I say this, but I am concerned. I want to go back to April of 2017, right here at Shaggy Shane, one Shaggy Shane drive with Lance Twidwell. We both talked about quarterbacks. I said I wanted Patrick Mahomes because I felt at that time if Patrick Mahomes could sit a year and learn Andy Reid's offense, he would be a genius because Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, Andy Reid could show and mentor Patrick Mahomes and uh, show him what the NFL is all about. And uh, I think we both had a consensus after our, us three went to training camp numerous times that I think Patrick Mahomes could start his rookie season. It didn't happen, but nevertheless, Nevertheless, Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes were great last year. Patrick Mahomes had 50 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, threw for over 5,000 yards. But come AFC Championship time, the Chiefs were trailing 14 to nothing at halftime, only amassed 32 yards of total offense. The points I made about my criticism of Andy Reid is he's lost three conference championship games at home. When you go into the conference championship games at home, you're supposed to be in invincible. You're supposed to be able to lead your team. But in three conference championship games at home, Andy Reid was outcoached. He was outcoached by John Fox, John Gruden, and Bilicek. And the two home losses at Philadelphia, Philadelphia only had one touchdown in two games. They lost to the Buccaneers 27 to 10 in January 2003, and they lost 14 to 3 at home to the Carolina Panthers. The next year they won a home game and advanced to the Super Bowl, but that's my concern. Why is Andy Reid so outcoached in conference championship play? He's one and four. Lance, I want to start with you. What is is my assess is my criticism real? Bring it. If you disagree, you know what's up. Talk to me about my criticism of Andy Reid in conference championship games. The thing about it is, is that you're not wrong about really anything in that. Um, He's a very uh, controversial character when it comes to coaching. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of problems that he has, and I've touched about I've touched on this on my own show. Uh, the the issues that I have with Andy Reid is the fact that I think his biggest weakness is also a strength that a lot of people like to have, but in business it doesn't always pan out. And what I mean by that is his greatest weakness is definitely his loyalty, uh, and loyalty to the wrong people. He was loyal to Alex Smith until it was too late when he did, like like Shane just alluded to he should have started Patrick Mahomes day one. 
Uh, he didn't do that, and then the playoff game, it blew up in our faces all over again, and it caused more heartache for us and even further trust issues with this franchise. And then he's loyal to a fault with Bob Sutton, giving him an, a, a sixth year when he should have been fired several years before then. And that blew up in our face again in the AFC Championship when he was unwilling to adjust, as quoted by numerous players in that locker room, that stated he refused to adjust his schemes, his game plan on a week-in and week-out basis, even when it wasn't working on a week-in and week-out basis. Those are Andy Reid's biggest problems. So with that considered, I do agree with you. The, prob the, the other side of it, though, and the problem that he is and why he is such a complex individual is because he also does so many great things. And the results are there. Because Andy Reid, despite the fact that he's had a long history of bad and average quarterbacks that he's led further than they ever should have gone, he has had more regular season wins than five Hall of Fame coaches in the NFL. Now, those guys do also have Hall, uh, uh, Super Bowls, which separate them ultimately from Andy Reid. But the issue with it is, is that Andy Reid has never had the quarterbacks that a lot of these guys have had throughout history. So I do give him a break on that. So I am in the middle with this, and I am willing to give Andy Reid more time because the first time he's ever had an elite quarterback in his entire career as a head coach, he went to the AFC Championship in a game he should have won. The problem was his loyalty won out, and it ended up costing this team a chance at the Super Bowl. A Super Bowl I think we would have won. So there's a lot of issues that I have with the guy, but I'm willing to give him another opportunity with Patrick Mahomes to prove us some of us wrong because you're not alone in the feelings you have about have about Andy Reid. You know, I would not want Patrick Mahomes coming into any other situation. If Patrick Mahomes came to Kansas City with Todd Haley as his coach, Todd Haley would mother F him up and down the sidelines, and it would it was a, be a, a bad environment. If Todd Haley came here with Brian Dayball as his offensive coordinator, Romeo Cornell as his coach, it would be a bad environment. Patrick Mahomes came into a perfect environment with Andy Reid. That's my point. I think it's a, they're, they're great together. But I think, and I'm going to get Clay's opinion on this, about my criticism of Andy Reid, and it's important that I get his opinion on this. Uh, Mike Kafka and, and Eric Bieniemy need to stick around to take Patrick Mahomes to the next level after 2018. Clay, now that you've heard me and Lance's view on the criticism of Andy Reid, what is your take on this? Well, you actually first broached this subject almost immediately after the AFC Championship game. Correct. And, and I disagreed with you then. And I disagree with you now. Okay. First thing first, I'll say, whatever happened in Philadelphia stays in Philadelphia. I don't judge Andy Reid on anything that happened in Philadelphia. As far as I'm concerned, he's, he's 0 for 1 in championship games in Kansas City. He was an offsides penalty away from the Super Bowl. That's, that's a coin flip. That's luck. I don't hold that against him at all. And I think... Any criticism of Andy Reid, if you're going to criticize Andy Reid, you're essentially saying, hey, maybe the Chiefs would be better off without him. And I think that's lunacy. I think the only chance the Chiefs have in the, in the next, you know, the, 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 the cheap years of the Patrick Mahomes contract is to be uh, locked in with Andy Reid, locked in with Patrick Mahomes, and... That's the best chance you're going to have because anybody else you're going to bring in to coach this team is going to be an unknown, and you don't want that right now. Uh, you've built something here. You want to keep that momentum going. And uh, like Lance said, Andy Reid finally has his quarterback. Is Andy Reid any worse than, than Bill Cower or Mike Shanahan or Tony Dungy, who didn't win Super Bowls until they got their quarterback. And Andy Reid finally has his, and I think that's going to lead to great things. With Doug Peterson uh, leaving the Kansas City Chiefs as offensive coordinator, taking the Philadelphia Eagles to a Super Bowl victory, Matt Nagy leaving Kansas City as offensive coordinator, being the 2018 NFL Coach of the Year. How important is it to you, Clay? I'm going to start with you first to keep either Mike Kafka or Eric Bieniemy. And if let's say in two years when Andy Reid does retire, if you had to pick, would you be happy with either Mike Kafka and, and Eric Bieniemy? Uh, right now, I don't. I don't want to see any change in the Chiefs' offensive staff. I feel like they could survive it because they survived uh, losing Doug Pedersen last year, but. If the Chiefs are going to have their best chance at the Super Bowl next year and the year after and even the year after, I don't want to see any change in the staff. But 
I feel like if Andy Reid were to retire in two or three years, absolutely, uh, it would be a very smooth transition if they could just they could just uh, move the enemy or Kafka right into the head coach role. Would you be comfortable with that? Andy Reid will be Andy Reid will be 61 years old next weekend. Uh, would you be comfortable with Kafka and the enemy in a couple years, Lance? It's tough to say right now because I I don't know the value, uh, the significant value those guys play. In particular, with Patrick Mahomes' development, because he is still developing, as crazy as that sounds, with him having the second, maybe the greatest season we've ever seen a player have at only 23 years old. Um, he's still, despite all that, he's still developing as a player. He's still learning this game, and I, I want to give those guys due credit because I think they play a factor. I just don't know how much. So, barring all that, I, I don't see. And, and this is just a side note. I don't see Andy Reid retiring anytime soon. He just extended. He just uh, signed that five-year extension, I believe, before this last before season. Before the 17, yeah. Yeah. So he's got. I think he's got another three or four years at least left in him. So I don't think we're going to be having to worry about that for quite a while. And I do believe the Chiefs are going to be winning a Super Bowl, or at least being in the Super Bowl in the next couple of years. So with that, with that aside, for me, I feel like the Chiefs lost their best coordinators over the last couple of years already. So if they were to, if you were to see a significant downfall, if you were to see a drop off, we would have already seen it. Patrick Mahomes is a band aid for a lot of those types of things. Uh, if you look at all all the great quarterbacks throughout history, you can only name maybe a few coordinators they've ever had. And the only reason why we can name a couple of them is because the Patriots are in the Super Bowl every single year. And you know who Josh McDaniels is right. for all the controversy he had in Denver, for all the problems he had when he backed out of the Colts situation. So if you look throughout history, Peyton Manning, you can't name any of his coordinators. Uh, if you look at, at Joe Montana, I bet you couldn't name me his coordinators. Paul Hackett. I mean, okay, well, that's what, okay. <laughs> Mike Shanahan. Shanahan. <laughs> Touche on that. All right, I'll give you that one. My point is this. Coaches and quarterbacks get the credit for wins. So although I do believe that Kafka and, and Vietnam play their significant roles, I don't think if we were to lose these guys over the next year or two, I don't think that this offense would suffer dramatically. And quite frankly, I don't think this team would suffer dramatically because if you look at Andy Reid's system, if you look at his tree, he's lost a lot of not just coordinators, but really good coordinators who have become successful head coaches in the league, far more than Belichick ever had, but yet Andy Reid continued to win. So that's why I'm not worried about it if we were to lose those guys. If we lose them, it's, I'm okay with it. If we keep them, I'm grateful because, like Clay said, I'm not in the mood for for more change because we've seen a lot of change over in Kansas City over the last several years when it comes to coordinators. All right, all right. Let's get right to the chief situation. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a list of free agents that are aren't under contract right now. Uh, they are Anthony Sherman, Jeff Allen, Stephen Nelson, Jordan Lucas, Harrison Butker, Kelvin Benjamin, Justin Ham Hamilton, just the top eight, Allen Bailey, another one. Uh, looks like we're going to lose Justin Houston and D Ford. With that said, we're going to a 4-3. You're going to need three linebackers. Uh, right now, Anthony Hitchens is a middle linebacker. He played his best ball in a 4-3 in 2017. Pro Football Focus said Anthony Hitchens did not miss a tackle because he had, you know, he had the two interior linemen in a 4-3 playing in front of him. He was he was terrible in a 3-4. Dorian O'Daniel will be the linebacker opposite of Anthony Hitchens. Lance, who do you like? I mean, I know it I know we don't know exactly yet who's going to be that third linebacker. What do you see happening with the Chiefs in that situation if they're going to go to a 4-3 March 9th? I know a lot of things can happen. What do you think about that situation? Is it a concern to you? Oh, or yeah. Do you like somebody? Oh, it's, it's a concern uh, because as we talked about even before the show and as I've talked on my show as well, that uh, the Chiefs are going to have to answer that position probably early in the draft or go and sign a, a veteran free agent. Uh, the problem with the veteran free agent is the market is going to be high. You're, you're looking at spending at least 13 to $15 million a year on a guy at that position. Uh, and I don't think that that position needs to be filled with that type of money attached to it because you already have Tyreek Hill, Tyreek Hill Chris Jones that you're going to have to pay significant money to in this offseason alone. And with the Chiefs only having around $30 million in cap space as it is, and the other uh, pieces you're going to have to move in place in order to even be able to afford guys like that at those positions, I don't think that's worth it. I think the Chiefs need to be able to build around other pieces in free agency and draft their guy at that other position. Dorian O'Daniel will be the will on the other side of Anthony Hitchens. I fully expect Anthony Hitchens to play better because he couldn't play any worse this year in the new scheme. And I think that a guy next to them is going to have a lot of pressure off of him because those other two guys are going to be the ones that everyone's looking at. So I definitely think if, the, if, I'm, a, if I'm the one that's making that call, I think the Chiefs need to answer in the mid-rounds with that position and get their guy who they believe, even if they need to trade up, 
who they think is the guy for that position for years to come. Right, right. And a lot of Chiefs fans are freaking out. They don't understand the difference between a 3-4 and a 4-3. They think, oh, no, we're going to lose Justin Houston and D4. Those are our prime sack. Those are prime guys that can that create sacks. In a 4-3, you want your defensive ends, uh, either Tano Pasquale and Breland Speaks on the outside, getting pressure to uh, get on the quarterback in a 4-3. But to bat, not to forget about the pressure on sacks and I want to talk about corners for a second. They got Chardarius Ward, who's a big body size cornerback. Right now on the other side, Steve Nelson uh, is more than likely gone, so you're just going to have Chardarius Ward and Kendall Fuller. Is there any free agents that you like, Clay? Is there anybody that you would like to see the Chiefs get in free agency or in the draft uh, to uh, take away from Steven Nelson's absence if he indeed leaves? Well, in general, I'm not a huge fan of spending a whole crap ton of money on free agents, especially the way the Chiefs are set up now where they have a lot of players they have to, have to pay coming up. What I do like the idea of, though, is signing a veteran cornerback who uh, has a lot of experience and maybe might come cheaper. Uh, when you look at how the Chiefs' corners played last year, uh, just mental mistakes really killed them, mm -hmm. like the... the uh, the two-point conversion in the Chargers game, huge mental mistake. You, you feel like a veteran cornerback would not make that mistake. So, you know, in free agency, you have a guy like Kareem Jackson. He's, I mean, he's 31 years old, but uh, you feel like he's a guy who could stop the bleeding uh, in that sense. And you have another guy like Jason McCourty, who's 32 years old. These guys aren't going to be super, super expensive. The Chiefs could probably afford them. And uh, maybe even like sign like a one or, or two year deal that doesn't stretch the cap too much. So that's what I would really like to see the Chiefs do with corners in free agency. Good point, good points. And Lance, I know it's early. The new year starts in four days, but just looking at it, everything as of right now, when the Chiefs go to a four three, who do you like to get pressure on the quarterback? I know Alan Bailey is more likely to be gone. Tano Pasmio, this should be his time to freaking show that he's worthy of a second-round pick in 2017. Who do you like? You don't have to give me names per se, but do you feel like the Chiefs will have enough pressure on the front four to get pressure on a quarterback in a 4-3? As it currently stands, no. they got a lot of work to do. Uh, Chris Jones is the only real proven commodity as it stands that we have full confidence in we'll be here next year. More than likely, Justin Houston will be gone. Well, he's going to be gone. D Ford is going to be traded. The Packers are very, very big on him. They really want him. And by the time this video might upload, they might already get him. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of problems with what they have currently. The, the thing I talked about on my show last night was um, the scheme is what gives me some relief because I think that even when you have a team that is, a, is, is void of certain names or guys that you know very well or you're very familiar with, if the scheme is effective, it doesn't matter if you have those guys or not. If you look at the Patriots... Um, they had a good defense, but as the season went on, their scheme got better and better. They became more efficient within that scheme, and you saw how great they were in that first half against the Chiefs, getting to Patrick Mahomes so quickly, and you can't name me three or four of those guys on the defensive line for them, so the casual fan couldn't. So that's my point, is I think that if the Chiefs were able to draft their guys, trade up in the draft, get their guys in the, in the front, the exterior, the defensive end, I'm sorry, the interior, the defensive end that they feel and they have the faith that can come in here and immediately make impact and quite honestly, light a fire under Breland Speaks' ass, which I think he quite frankly needs. Um, and, and I think, honestly, he's going to fit better into this scheme as well because he's built more for this type right. of defense than he was in the 3-4. So he had kind of an unfair advantage against him going into last season in his rookie year. That's a lot for a young guy to take on. So I want confidence in Breland Speaks. I want confidence in Tonal Passanio. I want confidence in some of these younger guys. I want confidence in the guys we're going to draft. But there, right now, as it currently stands, there's only one man that I know on this defense that's going to show up every single week and get pressure on that quarterback, and that is Chris Jones. Yes, the whole entire defense is built around Chris Jones. Watching Tano Pasquio and Breland Speaks in training camp uh, the last two years, uh, try to cover tight ends 30 yards down the field was a joke. There are four three defensive ends. Tano Pasquio's, like I said, his big body got to get after the quarterback. All right, let's look at the free agents that are out there. Uh, Landon Collins is a lot of top, a lot of hype, a, a big, but we all know it's going to take a lot of money to bring him to Kansas City. Uh, we have a lot of money invested in Eric Berry as another safety. A lot of Chiefs fear, a lot of Chiefs fans fear. Oh man, if we invest in another safety, is that going to be a good thing? Are we gun shy? What do you think? Is Landon Collins a safety you want, Clay? Well, like you said, he's going to cost a lot of money, and I think when you spend that kind of money, 
you ought to get a player who is a complete player who is elite at his craft almost across the board you would want him to be like Eric Berry was in his prime or like Earl Thomas was in his prime and I feel like Landon Collins is not that kind of player uh, some people have said he's a glorified linebacker uh, Chiefs could certainly use a hard-hitting safety to fill that role but I feel like you don't have to spend top money to get a player like that I don't feel like Landon Collins would be worth the kind of money they would have to spend to bring him in. But if Spag, if the Chiefs do spend a lot of money, and knowing that Spagnola, he's a Spagnola guy, would you be happy with that, or would you still be concerned? I mean, look, if the Chiefs sign Landon Collins, I'll probably do my best to be as excited as I can. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I still, I'm gonna sit there and think, well, is can this guy cover tight ends? Is he? Is he going to be a liability in coverage at, against like top offenses? Is he really going to be worth the money? And if they spend that kind of money on him, are they going to have enough money for everybody else? All right, all right. And Lance, uh, you, uh, you brought up some good nights. Check out The Spoken on Facebook. Uh, Lance Twidwell breaks it down uh, 20, on every Friday. He's, he's got a whole slew of names that I want to get to. Lance? Tell me about these safeties besides Landon Collins you feel would be perfect to come into Kansas City this year. The guy that I've been talking to a lot of the people I trust the most is uh, the Chicago Bears' uh, Adrian Imos. Uh, he's 25 years old. Uh, he's only missed four games in his entire career as well. Never been on the IR, whereas Landon Collins has been on the IR twice. Uh, Landon Collins didn't miss very many games because both the times he was on the IR, they are at the end of the season, towards the end of the season. So he didn't miss as many games, but he was out for a, quite, a, quite a while. Uh, Adrian Amos is a much better hitter. Uh, I know that uh, Landon Collins is a glorified linebacker, like Clay said, that is very true. He has a problem uh, guarding tight ends, and that's something we know all too well in Kansas City with our safeties. But uh, Adrian Amos is the first name that comes up, to the, comes up, but here's the problem. When we talk about money, I've been looking at the market value for both of these players because I think it's going to come down to one of those two if they're going to ultimately sign a safety in free agency. Uh, SpotTrack.com has both these guys on identical contracts coming up. We're talking five years, 49 to $50 million, with about 35 of that guaranteed. So either way the Chiefs look at it, they're going to have to sign one of these guys, and they're going to have to pay them big money. Now, I know the Eric Berry contract gives a lot of people uh, anxiousness, but the problem with that is, is that Eric Berry, when healthy, was the best safety in football, so that contract at the time was worth it. He just had a bad string of luck with injuries, and I think he lost a lot of the love for the game because of those injuries and because of the, the, the uh, health issues he had in 20, uh, 2015. So you have to kind of put that aside because Eric Berry's not going to be on this team in 2019, more than likely. So you have to be able to sacrifice your uh, pain for a little bit and realize that this is a new time and they're going to have to sign one of these guys either way. Um, outside of the safety position, though, there's other guys out there that the Chiefs can be looking at. Trey Flowers is one guy that stands out to me from the Patriots, formerly out of the Patriots. He's 26 years old. Uh, they were 0-2 with that, and that actually means something with the Patriots. Uh, he's an incredible pass rusher, but he's an even better run stopper, and that's something the Chiefs absolutely need. Then there's Frank Clark, and there's other guys like that out there, but I think if the Chiefs are going to be spending money in free agency, it will be at the safety position. Those are the two biggest names, and Landon Collins and Adrian Amos, that come off the board, and I think one of those two guys will be a Chief in 2019. What can you tell me about Frank Clark? Frank Clark, the problem with him is he's 26. He's coming off a career year, but his career year is 13 sacks. Now, that's really good. But we haven't seen enough from Frank Clark to really think that this is the kind of guy that you want to spend big money on. And being an edge rusher, you're going to make money. It's the second most important position on the field. So you're going to make money playing that position. And the, the only concern, like I said, is he. I, the, the concern I maybe have is that he may have peaked. He may have been trying to play for a contract. And once he gets that money, is he going to still be the same Frank Clark that we saw in 2018? The good thing is I think he's a great fit for the system. I think he'd be a great fit because regardless of who comes in, you're losing Houston and Ford. That guy's going to have a lot of eyes on him because if he fails at all, every, all the fans, you know what's going to be said. They should have kept Ford. They should have tried to restructure Houston. That's going to be the excuse going on and on. So whoever comes in here is going to have a lot of pressure on him. Can a guy like Frank Clark handle that type of pressure? I don't know. My confidence isn't with him. So if they're going to spend money at that position, I'm going to go with Trey Flowers. He played for a championship organization. They clearly missed him when he was out, and I think that's the kind of guy you'd want to spend money on. What, on cornerback, what do you like on corner? 
Well, this is actually the interesting thing because I don't think there's a good enough corner out there for them to go and sign long term. I think that Kareem Jackson is that guy that I like a lot. He is 31, but he played very well in 2018. He's actually been a very good uh, protector of deep passes as well, which I really like for this for this defense. I had a theory last night. And I've actually been sticking with this often. I actually think if the Chiefs are going to go cornerback, they don't need to worry about free safeties. They need to try to trade for one. And the guy that I would actually love, and, ab and I've been saying it since last season, was Patrick Peterson out of Arizona. Word! Now, see, he, this is why it's so beautiful. He's an elite 28-year-old cornerback that's never really had any significant injuries, at least over the last few years. Sam! And he's had tw he only has $23.5 million left on his deal. With that type of value and that kind of great player, you bring him into this system. You give the Cardinals a couple mid-round picks or a first and a couple mid-round picks that you accumulate from a D forward trade. Preach it. You automatically put yourself in a position to have a guy that can travel, something we haven't had here in years with Bob Sutton's system. You can have that guy traveling against the number one wide receiver every week. Hell yeah! You can draft your cornerback. That's what I'm talking no about. No pressure on that kid to come in here. Whatever right. whatever position you draft him in, he has no pressure because you have Pat Pete being your number one guy, and then you move Kendall Fuller back into the slot, which he was the number one graded slot defender in the NFL in 2017. So you move him back to his natural position. All of a sudden, you have solidified your defensive backs. And again, they're going to sign either Landon Collins or Adrian Amos, one of those two guys. So you have automatically a very respectable defensive back core. So that's my theory. Maybe it won't happen because I know Patrick Peters, Patterson, Peterson is very loyal to Arizona. He's been saying nothing but since he demanded that trade in October yeah. that he wants to stay there. But, man, I'm telling you, if Arizona sees the writing on the wall here, that they have a team that they're trying to build for the next three to four years, which Patrick Peterson won't be a part of their future, they need to capitalize on his abilities and his talents now while he's still in the prime of his career and give him to a team that's trying to win titles. Come on, the Arizona. Chiefs, the Chiefs are that team. That's, the, that's my theory. Hell yeah, way to break it down, brother Lance. All right, Clay, I want to get your... Quick answer, just give me keep or cut when I list these names with the Kansas City Chiefs. Anthony Sherman. Keep. Jeff Allen. Cut. Steve Nelson. Keep. Safety Jordan Lucas. Keep. Harrison Butker. Keep. Kelvin Benjamin. Cut. <laughs> Terrence Smith. Cut. Chris Conley, wide receiver. Cut. Charkandrick West. Keep. Jordan Debbie, third string center. Keep. Mitch Morse. Keep. Alan Bailey. Keep. And all that we tied in Demetrius Harris. Cut. Thank you. All right, all right. Uh, Mitch Morse, which brings me to. Mitch Morse suffered a couple of concussions. He's going to be an unrestricted free agent. We're going to go to the offense here. Uh, what is your concern about Mitch Morse concussions? You know, you said you want to keep him. Are you concerned with that? Do you think he's been able to shake it off? Do you like what he can bring to the Chiefs in 2019, Clay? Well, you know, the concussions are a concern, but I feel like if you, if you, if you go back and watch the AFC Championship game again and you watch the Chiefs line just not knowing what to do in the first half against the Patriots right. and, their, and their stunts and the schemes they pulled with their pass rush, I don't want the Chiefs to enter next season with a brand new center, especially with a young quarterback, and have uncertainty at that position. So for me, I feel like, especially because of the, the concussion thing, Mitch Morse is not going to draw a huge contract in free agencies. The Chiefs should be able to keep him, and then you could keep your, I mean, when healthy, he's a very good center. So. You keep him, and you can keep uh, some semblance of uh, continuity on the offensive line, uh, and that's what you want going forward. All right. Uh, what do you think about Mitch Morse? Are you concerned with that? Would you? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want Mitch Morse any any more on this team. I, I, I mean, I agree with what Clay's saying. When he is healthy, he is a damn good center. Problem is, is he's missed over 17 games over the last two seasons. And although I do agree with the sentiment that you want to keep Patrick Mahomes protected up front. If you're not on the field, you're not protecting him anyway. So I'm not going because yeah, he will not he will not uh, demand high dollar. But any money spent on a center that can't stay on the field to me is a waste of money. So although he is only 26 going on 27, I don't trust a guy who's had several not not a couple several concussions in his early 20s. I don't trust that he's going to be a guy that I can have on the field on a day and day out basis when we're trying to win Super Bowls. I would rather the Chiefs go another route. Is it risky? Yes. 
but I feel like it's even riskier to go with a guy who's had several brain injuries and spend money on him and trust that he all of a sudden is going to play 16 games every single season. I'm not willing to take that risk because for the same reasons, ironically, that Clay is saying he wants to protect Patrick. If I'm trying to protect Patrick, I'm going to go a route that almost solidifies better health just from the signing alone. Austin Ryder played very well as a center last year for the Chiefs. So did Jordan Devy. Jordan Devy was the center in Patrick Mahomes' first ever NFL start on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2017 in Denver. And he did a good job. He, he played he, they're great depth. If Mitch Morse comes back and uh, in June with a, he doesn't get the offers he wants, I think he would be a good pick player to have if, if, if it's a cap-friendly deal and maybe have him compete with a free agent or a draft pick uh, for the offense. All right, guys. Uh, today, the Kansas City Chiefs side, Carlos Hyde, which pretty much means the end for Charkandrick West and Spencer Ware. Uh, what do you think about this Carlos Hyde signing Clay? Well, uh, I like it personally. I love it. The first thing that comes to mind is Spencer Ware and how he has been, uh, you know, he's a little injury prone. Uh, and I really think the Chiefs, they need, needed some stability at that position. Some Chief stability. And he came cheap. I mean, I mean he wasn't better minimum but he was he was fairly cheap in the grand scheme of things and uh like uh like our friend uh matt verderame said on twitter uh just yesterday Who? matt verderame <laughs> we've all heard of him i didn't know him until you guys started talking uh, about it that's well, another podcast <laughs> like he said though about carlos high i think he's holding this l accordingly <laughs> From the smoke in the like plane. matt said <laughs> go ahead uh carlos high is he's a big back which uh, fits the mold the Chiefs have, have had uh, here recently with with Spencer Ware. And uh, he's a good receiving back. He's good in the, in the receiving game, in the passing game. And that fits what they want to do. And, he, you know, he's relatively young. Uh, and, you know, you never want to spend big money on running backs. We've learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, and I think, I think a guy like Carlos Hyde is exactly the kind of guy that the Chiefs should be signing at running back. I think this ends any talk of, uh, any crazy talk of Le'Veon Bell. Thanks, Chris Jones. And, and I, I don't want to see the Chiefs <laughs> such a tease. draft a running back, clowning. you know, before the fifth round this year because I <laughs> Chris Jones, can you believe you did that? If I can finish. <laughs> Go ahead. I really don't want to see the Chiefs draft a running back before the fifth round this year because... With Carlos Hyde, they have everything they need in the backfield. Great point. The last time the Kansas City Chiefs gave a lot of money to a running back was Jamal Charles near the end of his prime. Uh, the last time the Kansas City Chiefs drafted a running back high in the draft was in the second round, Nile Davis. He's gone. The Chiefs seem to pick up anybody. They get some nobody in 2015 named Spencer Ware who comes in in these newfound Newfound glory. They get some nobody in Charkandrick West, and he comes out of nowhere, and he's great. In this offense, bring in some running back out of nowhere. You can bring some running back uh, out of nowhere, and they will be solid next to Damian Williams. He, Damian, speaking of Damian Williams, he was the third string running back of the Kansas City Chiefs. In this offense, with Patrick freaking Mahomes, he freaking, he's glorious. The Chiefs offense is glorious. I mean, son of a bitch! What can you say about this Kansas City Chiefs offense? If we, if somebody would have said before the 2018 season began, oh, Patrick Mahomes is going to pass for 50 touchdowns and 12 interceptions and 5,000 yards, and the Chiefs are going to be the number one seed in the AFC, we would have thought, man, I bet you the Chiefs blew out a lot of opponents. Ah, the defense sucked, but we're looking ahead. Take a Spagnola. We were right there. All right? Uh, Lance... Out of all the free agents out there, out of all the free agents out there right now, who do you covet the most? Is it the safety that you alluded to on the spoken and here within the last few minutes? Is there somebody out there you would think, man, this guy in the can needs to come to Kansas City and I will just freaking stay up all night partying like a meth head? But you're not on meth. <laughs> but not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you, later. Who do you look out the man? I want the Chiefs to get this guy. Who and why? Oh well, I mean, if we're if we're just doing like fantasy world scenarios, I mean, I would love Jamie Collins. I would absolutely love him. I think that the Browns letting him go that was 
If no money was attached to it, if we just could pick him up, that would be a great signing. 29-year-old edge rush guy. I think he'd be amazing for the Chiefs to pick up. He is going to be way too expensive. That's just the reality of it. But, yes, if, if I'm choosing between the two safeties. I've been very conflicted. Uh, I like a lot of things about Landon Collins, but he does have the injury problem. He does have the coverage problem, and I don't think he's great. He's good. I think Adrian Amos is the guy that I would probably go with. Uh, the Bears have been known for tough defense. He was the toughest guy on that defense. I think he would be the guy that I would love to have because he brings some nasty, and this defense needs some nasty. We've been too soft for too long. Saying. Playing a conservative-style defense. Spagnuolo is going to go after the quarterback. Adrian Amos is the kind of guy that can be in a box safety. He can also be a good coverage safety as well. Make it happen. So I'm going to probably go with Adrian Amos. Hell yeah, Adrian Amos. All right, Clay, I'm going to ask you a two-part question. I want to start out with this. Who is it you do not want the Chiefs to sign? Like, if they sign and you'll go, oh, crap, why'd they sign this guy? Honestly, the, the first name... Actually, a name doesn't come to mind. The, f the first thing that comes to mind is is any linebacker that costs them money. I feel like in the 4-3, the linebacker position has less value than the other posi positions on the defense. So I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with the Chiefs entering next season with Dorian O'Daniel at weak side linebacker, Anthony H Hitchens in the middle, and a draft pick at strong side linebacker. So if you ask me what one position, not necessarily a name, but a position, I don't want to see the Chiefs sign in free agency, it's linebacker. Excellent, excellent. And the second part of that question, Clay, who is it that you want? Who's keeping you up at night, waking up thinking, oh man, I gotta have the Chiefs sign this guy? Uh, I, I, actually, it's, it's not really a signing. Uh, when Lance talked about Patrick Peterson, uh, it really got me thinking. Me too. About how the 49ers got back to and won the Super Bowl. Thinking. In the early 90s. In 1992, Listen the in. 49ers couldn't get past the Dallas Cowboys. Nope. In 1993, the 49ers couldn't get past the Dallas, Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys. In 1994, the 49ers said, you know what? Prime time. We have to get past the Cowboys. We're going to sign Deion freaking Sanders. The best. If the Chiefs want to get past the New England Patriots. Got to do it. Go get Patrick Peterson. Sam. Go, go get him. Hell yeah, great points. Clay. All right, uh, damn good points. All right, uh, Tyreek Hill, rumor-wise, and it's pretty much from a reliable source what we're all hearing. Tyreek Hill's about to be paid a big, fat contract. I, myself, am concerned with that. No, I don't hate Tyreek Hill. I love Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is the most explosive weapon in the National Football League. He sends fear through all defensive coordinators. You can do so much with him. But Brett Veach wants to get ahead of the contract of Tyreek Hill because he doesn't want to lose out. He saw what John Dorsey did. John Dorsey lost those bargaining uh, negotiations with Justin Houston and Eric Berry because he waited to the last minute. Lance, is it important right now to make Tyree Kill the number one wide receiver with a big fat contract, or do you wait until next year and take the chance of going into John Dorsey territory? Talk to me. If Brett, if Brett, Re Brett Beach wants to get fired like John Dorsey did, then he should wait another year. Because <laughs> if you're you're crazy to think that Tyree Kill is going to regress anytime soon. This guy is actually getting better at football. He's already a, a, an incredible athlete. Bring it! The speed, the agility, all that stuff is just athleticism, sheer athleticism. But if you watched him this last season, he was getting so much better at his route running, his timing, his footwork. Those are things that are going to get better because he knows he's on the verge of superstardom. In fact, he already is there. But he could put himself in a position to be one of the all-time great receivers we've seen. He has that type of talent. If he can practice, he can match that with his practice and his work ethic. It's going to be incredible, especially with the arm of Patrick Mahomes throwing the ball. As far as the contract is concerned, I am in full support of it. They need to sign him to whatever. Back the back the truck up on him, man. Put the money on him right now. And the reason why I say that is because of the fact Bring that he has just turned 25 years old. You get him on a five-year deal right now, he won't even be 30 years old by the time that contract comes up. Cheetah! So that way you can have him. Use his prime up. And I know that sounds kind of screwed up, but it's the truth. It's a business. 
You get him in the prime years of his career, pay him that big money, you front load that with the guaranteed money in the first three years of that contract, you get that fifth year option, you can decide at that point, is he worth signing at 29, 30 years old? You can revisit that. In the meantime, you are solidifying the best and perfect, he's the perfect fit for Patrick Mahomes' style and skill set. You pat, you patch him up for at least four or five years with Patrick Mahomes. You are sustaining greatness on the offensive side. This offense is never going to take a downfall with those two paired up together. You look at guys like Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison. You saw that one year with Tom Brady and Randy Moss and what they did. It is the same exact situation. You have to sign this guy. It would be crazy for the Chiefs to let him go out there and prove it one more year and then have to pay him $120, $130 million as opposed to 95 to 100 Hell yes! All right, Clay, hold this phone. You're Brett Veach. It's ringing. Bring. Hey, uh, Brett, uh, this is uh, Cliff Kingsbury, the Arizona Cardinals. I want to give you the number one overall pick for Tyreek Hill. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> so Tyreek Hill won't be traded to the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> All right, Clay. Uh, next question. Do you feel that Tyreek Hill is worth the big fat contract that Lance says he is? To me, Tyreek Hill is the most valuable non-quarterback in the game of football today. Uh, and one thing, Lance touched on this, about the fact that Tyreek Hill is only going to get better and better. I feel like a big part of that is, when you look at the history of the Chiefs, when they've had such a revolving door not only a quarterback, but also a wide receiver. Their quarterbacks and wide receivers have never really been able to get completely in sync with each other over a long period. Now you have an opportunity where Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill can really get a connection going where they can become a, like a, a, just a real dynamic offensive force like Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison were in, in Indianapolis. Saying like like Montana was with Jerry Rice, John Taylor, uh, even even like uh, Troy Aikman and Michael Irvin in Dallas. Uh, the Chiefs are, have the opportunity to have that kind of tandem, which they really have never had before. Not really since Otis Taylor and, and Len Dawson cool. fifty years ago. Hell so. Yeah. Yes, he is absolutely worth every penny of whatever he gets paid. All right, all right, all right. I can't thank my guests enough, Lance Twidwell and Clay Windler. Uh, these guys are both great guys. I'm, my subscribers, my 1,900 subscribers that follow me on YouTube, I'm sure you haven't, I'm sure you've seen the greatness of Red Tribe Cinema on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, check out The Spoken on Facebook and on Spotify, and where else can people can hear your, your weekly Friday shows, which I will be a guest next Friday on The Spoken on Facebook. Tell my viewers where they can listen to this great podcast, brother. Yeah, you can find The Spoken Podcast on every Friday night on Spotify, Anchor, uh, uh, Radio Republic, Stitcher, several other platforms that you can find all podcasts on. Definitely give us a look, guys. Uh, we're going to be doing these shows every week. We just had Clay on last week. Uh, we had some good. We have uh, local brands on every week, also to give a little reflection of what's going on in your local community com companies you might not even be aware of, but you are now. And my guy Shaggy Shane will be on, like he said, this next week. We're really looking forward to bringing you guys on with us. Hell so yeah, hell excited. yeah, man! It's an exciting time to be a Kansas City Chiefs man. I'm with my two brothers here, who uh, with Clay Winters, Gene, freaking awesome work. We made Curse of the Kingdom and Rise of Mahomes. Man, I want to say, dude, those freaking videos are badass. Here, here. I'm the, here, here. I'm the fake. Hell yeah, dude. I do the fake Andy Reid. He does the fake Patrick Mahomes. This guy. The only <laughs> fake Patrick the internet will ever need. To all you other fake Patricks, retire. <laughs> I'll drink to that. I'll drink to that. But, man, uh, we were in the minority this time last year because there were so many Kansas City Chiefs fans worried about losing Alex Smith. There were so many Kansas City Chiefs fans losing uh, uh Still want an, an inexperienced quarterback out there. And now there's millions and millions of fans worldwide. I'm a moderator on Patrick Mahomes' fan page on Facebook. And the love Patrick Mahomes gets is insane, but it's real and he deserves it. But us three were the first to preach it. My daughter, Tabitha, who's working this wonderful camera and edits the show, said I'm the number one Mahomie. I wear that badge proudly. 
Thank you everybody that follows me. Thank you everybody last year that helped me. Tara Francis, Pat Mahomes Sr., the Mahomes family who watches my stuff and shares our stuff and loves our stuff. Thank you Mahomes family. Thank you Kansas City Chiefs fans. The new year starts in four days. In four days. Clay, you want to say goodbye? I would like to say goodbye. I would also like to say, special announcement, if you want to see Patrick Mahomes play baseball, <laughs> if you want to see him play baseball, and you want to see his dad play baseball, together, Wow! come to Red Tribe Cinema. Oh man, that's that King Griffey Sr. and Jr. <laughs> Even better. Even better. <laughs> Kick ass, baby! Kick ass, Lance. You want to say anything in closing to my viewers? Hey, thanks a lot, guys, for listening. I really appreciate it. We've had some really good responses. Uh, obviously, Shane's got an incredible follow. Uh, Clay's got an incredible following as well, obviously. Uh, but I really appreciate everybody that's come by and checking out our podcast every Friday night, like I said. But this is the best. Like I, I thoroughly enjoy doing this with these guys. This is my favorite thing to do. And thank you so much, guys, for, for taking the time to listen to what we have to say and letting me ramble off a little bit. Thank you so much, guys. The three Chiefs amigos saying, Chiefs fans, get ready. The new year starts Wednesday. Are you with me? <laughs> Go Chiefs.